Hashem Hashem Nase Venatzliach, Shur Torah. Good to be here, Baruch Hashem, the Breast of Center. We have uh, another Shur, Bezot Hashem Shur Torah today. We'll be a Refua Shlema for our dear friend Shaul Ben Avner. Kalash Baruch Hu, Yitenu Refua Shlema, Refua Ta Nefesh, Refua Ta Guf. Also Refua Shlema to Levana Bat Sara, David Ben Nesriya, Doris Bat Jora. אלישבה חיה בת שרה, מרסדס בת, ג'ורה בת מרסדס, דבורה בת מרסדס, דבורה בת מרסדס, בעיניי יש לנו הרבה חיות. מי? סיסיל אסתר בת ימנה. בעזרת השם אוהב רפואה שלמה. ובעזרת השם, this show, בעזרת השם, הוא גרוע בשטרית לשמיים. And count for something. Count for something. Today, we're going to continue in the Mishnah in Perkei Avot. We are up to shiur number 118. I'm not sure if this specific shiur is going to be one shiur or a couple. Not really sure. Um, but, but uh, Hashem, we'll see. We'll see. Um, also, for... Uh, Anyone that wants to uh, give out CDs in their communities, Baruch Hashem, we just got a new shipment of 50,000 CDs. Now they come in a uh, very nice, cool package. has a little box. Each box has 25 double CDs, so each box is 50 CDs. And uh, that way, you could pretty much get one box, put it in the shul, put it at the uh, coffee shop, put it in the... Uh, Wherever, there's some Jewish center, and that's it, finished. Looks really nice, really cool. And this is uh, another way to make it easy for Amisla to do tshuva, because it seems like uh, Hashem wants people to listen to these shiurim. Today I got a uh, message from uh, some guy I'd never heard from before, and uh, he told me that he saw a shiurim on Roku. On the, we have a TV channel uh, on this... Uh, company called Roku uh, and um, we have our own station the Bezad Hashem station but to be honest with you it's unlike the internet like YouTube or Facebook or my website uh, or Tor Anytime all the other places that we have a shurim I don't uh, I don't really know how many people follow because there's no comments and uh, I also I don't get as much feedback from it so I didn't really know if it's working if it's not but whatever for uh, to publicize Torah, if it's another few dollars to publicize Torah, who knows if it's going to catch one body. You know, one person is going to do tshuva. The company says, Baruch Hashem, there are hundreds of subscribers to our channels. I think maybe a thousand subscribers or something to our Roku channel, which is unbelievable because we are the only real Jewish channel on the entire, uh, on the entire uh, company. Like, there are other companies that call themselves Jewish, but they're all Messianic Christian. They're all Messianic Christian. And then there's one secular Jewish. So it's like Zionism and stuff like that. So it's not really Jewish. It's Jewish by like name, but not really reality. Uh, so uh, Torah Anytime actually has a station, but they only use it apparently once a year for Tisha B'Av. So Baruch Hashem, we're the only ones on there. And we figured, you know what? Uh, you know, let's, let's try to do our best. Put our Shurim there. We have our uh, Musar Pikev out there. And as Hashem would have it, Somebody, you know, sends me an email just uh, today telling me that he wants to get some CDs because he uh, has been watching the shiurim for the last few weeks on Roku and he's doing tshuva. So you never really know. You never really know where Hashem is going to uh, point you to in order for you to find the truth. The Sefer Dvarim, Book of Deuteronomy, says that uh, at the end of times before Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to give everyone a fair chance. Everyone's going to get a fair chance to do tshuva. Everyone's going to get a fair chance to see the truth. But the Rambam says that not everybody's going to have the merit to do tshuva. Everyone's going to get an opportunity, but not everyone's going to have the merit to actually execute. And part of the reason is because some people... Rabbi Yisraeli Misalan says some people make so many sins in their life that they've got to the point that they are convinced 
with a hundred percent certification, belief, understanding, and muna that their sin is not only not a sin, it's actually a mitzvah. So when you come to them, you say, you need to do tshuva, they look behind them like you're talking to somebody else. Hey, you need to do tshuva. Who's he talking to? Because me, <laughs> you need to do tshuva? They got so used to the sins, miskenim, poor people, that they don't even realize they need to do tshuva. That's one, uh, one, one, one possibility. The other possibility, as the Rambam says, there are four types of people that Hashem does not allow them to do tshuva. They make a certain type of sin. It's not that it's so many sins that they themselves per se have made, but rather they led to so many sins. They influenced other people to make so many, so many sins by becoming a machtia rabin, someone that causes other people to sin, someone that knows that something is a sin and does not tell people, keeps it to themselves. He knows people are driving on Shabbat and he doesn't tell them that they're not allowed. And the Rambam says such people, Hashem does not allow them to do tshuva. Now what does it mean Hashem doesn't allow them to do tshuva? It means that Hashem is not going to help them. If they happen to do tshuva and they have a special merit in Shamaim for a schut avot, a forefather or something, and they are able to see the truth one day, they can do tshuva, they can. But not allow them to do tshuva, meaning that Hashem is not going to give them the special heavenly assistance that He gives every single Baal tshuva in order for them to achieve tshuva. Anyone that really did tshuva in their life knows the deeper they're in tshuva, the more they understand that they couldn't have done any of it. Not even a single step, not even the first step or the last step or the middle step without special assistance from heaven because they didn't even realize that most of the things they were doing were even sins. Yes. Okay. No, that's called somebody that's not fulfilling the mitzvah. And in that particular situation, you're taking on the sin yourself. So if you see somebody that you know driving on Shabbat and you never say anything, you never do anything about it, you don't give them a CD, you don't invite them to a lecture, you don't send them a video, you don't send them a link. You don't tell them something yourself. You don't do anything about it. You just act as if nothing happened. You, at that situation, have just inherited the sin. You also became a Mechalat Shabbat just like them. The Gemara in Masechet Abu Zara talks about it in multiple times that even Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria, one of the Tanaim, one of the greatest people that ever lived in this world, made that mistake and did not rebuke his neighbor after he saw that her cow was violating Shabbat. And when he found out that he made this mistake, he fasted until the end of his life. He fasted for 19 years. 19 years of fasting. Every day, meaning literally just eating when you absolutely, like after a few days, a week, weeks, whatever it is, whatever he was able to do, point is, but no day was ever normal from that moment on, doing tshuva for 19 years, for one day's mistake that somebody else violated Shabbat, because he said, chas v'shalom, they're going to call me a mechalel Shabbat in Shemaim. Because he saw that a cow was carrying, his neighbor's cow was carrying on Shabbat, and it's not allowed to carry, it's, uh, it's, it's considered work. You are not allowed to work, and neither is your animal allowed to work, and neither is your slave allowed to work, and, and anyone in your household. And he saw that his neighbor's cow was working, in essence, carrying something on Shabbat, carrying bells on Shabbat. And uh, he didn't say anything to the uh, widow that owned that cow. So the Gemara says, yes, in Shemaim they counted it as if that was his cow, meaning as if he was the Michal al Shabbat. And such is the fortune of a person who doesn't speak up when he sees other people sin. So the two types of people that are unfort in un very, very unfortunate situations. Today, the more I look, the more people send me things, the more I see that it's almost become like the majority of people. Like those two things that I just said, it's almost like the majority of people. 
It almost describes the majority of people, either the Machtiya Rabim, or they're quiet all the time, or they're outright kofrim, or it's it's one of the, these two descriptions. Unfortunately, de- de- describe a lot of people, and not a day passes when we don't find another horrible story about another person that calls themselves a rabbi or some type of leader that has taken a Torah and put garbage on it and desecrated Hashem's name like this one guy, Moskowitz, not the Moskowitz from Boca Raton, some other Moskowitz, who actually himself went off the derech when he was young and then decided to pretend like he's coming back on. He's from Lakewood. He lives in Lakewood. But it wasn't enough for him to be a normal, regular, quiet, religious Jew. No. He wants to be a special type of rabbi. What kind of rabbi? He wants to be an orthodox rabbi for the homosexuals, lesbians, bisexuals, and to'evat Hashem. He wants to be their rabbi. So he signed up to be a rabbi for all of the despicables of the world that cannot control their desires and want to parade about it. They are, the fact that you can't control your desires as a homosexual is a problem of its own. But what's the parade about? Why do you, what are you parading about? The fact that you're an animal? What are you so proud of? The fact that you cannot control yourself? That's something to be proud of? I don't understand. Why isn't there a straight parade? Why isn't anyone proud of being straight? Why isn't anyone proud of being normal? Why isn't anyone proud of eating steak? How come you only have uh, these, uh, these parades for people that are like abnormal? I don't understand why people celebrate these people. Not only that, this imbecile, Moskowitz from Lakewood, decides that he's going to not only be their rabbi, but he's also going to be the rabbi inside churches too. So he gives lectures inside Christians and Catholic churches too, which you're not even allowed to enter as a Jew. You're not allowed. The Gemara says in Avodah Zarah, if somebody is chasing you to kill you, somebody's chasing you, pikuach nefesh, and your choice are to hide into a bet avodah zarah in a place of idol worship like a church whether Christian or Catholic is irrelevant it's the same thing it's the same garbage you're not allowed to go in there meaning oh it's better off you die than going to a Catholic church this guy who looks like a average Hasidish guy he has the hat and the white and black and white he hasn't turned to rainbow yet that's next week the outfit is not rainbow yet so far it's black and white I'd rather it be rainbow so at least you can see oh you, you match. You match your customers. You match your donors. But this Abutai is every day, every day somebody else, some other porcupine comes out of the hole with his disgustingness. And I just don't understand. Why do you call yourself Orthodox? Why do you call yourself a Jew? Why don't you find a new career? Why don't you do something else? But it seems like this is all from Shamaim. Because Hashem is trying to make it very, very clear. What is truth and what is falsehood? Now, unfortunately, the problem is that in order for you to identify the difference between a diamond and a CZ, a cubic zirconium, with your eyes, even if you're the biggest expert in the world, many times you're not going to be able to identify the difference. If it's a good quality CZ, you're not going to be able to see with your own naked eye. You're not going to be able to see the difference between a CZ, piece of glass, and a diamond. So if you have a replica diamond, one of these rich people, these superstars, these basketball guys that have uh, 10 carats on their ears, they have a million dollars on their ears. People can't eat in the, in the, in the, in the world. They have a million dollars on each ear. One of these people has this thing, and he has this earring. It's a million dollar earring. It's a million, for an earring, a million dollars he spent. Now, if he went to sleep, and the people from the hotel that you know usually just focus on cleaning the, the room, they were criminals, professional criminals that were following him for a while, 
And then while he was sleeping, they went, they get per- perfect cubic zirconium, and they put it back in his ear. They put it back in his, in his earring. Now in the morning when he wakes up and he puts it in his ear, is he going to know the difference? No, first of all, the fact that he has something in his ear is a guy is a problem. Why does a guy have an earring? So obviously, if a guy has an earring, he's not paying attention to the details of what a guy is supposed to be in the first place in the world. Second of all, even if you are a professional diamond dealer, Unless you have a special eye, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between a cubic zirconium and a diamond. And that's why sometimes multimillionaires that buy these very, very expensive necklaces and bracelets and rings and so on that are worth a fortune, when you see them outside, if you know them personally, you know they're not wearing it. They're wearing the same replica in, with using cubic zirconium. They bought a, I remember I had one guy work for me. And he bought his wife, uh, he didn't have food to eat, but he bought his wife a $35,000 ring. Food to eat, he didn't have. He constantly had to borrow money for me. But he bought his wife a $35,000 ring, diamond ring. But it wasn't enough to buy her a $35,000 diamond ring. He bought a $2,000 replica. A $2,000 replica using a fake diamond. Fake diamonds. It cost him $2,000, so fake. So every time she would go out, and, you know, flash, hey, hey, you know, I have a, I have a, hey, I got, I got something. Like, the whole world needs to know you have a, uh, the moon on your arm. Hey, I got, it wasn't even real. It wasn't even real. It was the cubic zirconium that the, 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 the stone does not worth $5. And such is the life of many of these fakers in the world. They walk around and no one questions it. And the reason why is because everyone knows they could afford the million dollar ring and the $35,000 ring and the billion dollar ring. They can afford it. But those people don't want to, to take the risk of losing it or someone stealing it or and so on and so forth. So what do they do? They get a fake one. They get a fake ring, a fake diamond. Now, why do I tell you this? Because Arabi again, Allah Shalom, explained it best. Arabi again says the only way that you could, you could identify the difference between a cubic zirconium and a diamond is once you put pressure. Once you put pressure on the diamond, you know it's a diamond. Why? Because it has an enormous amount of power, an enormous amount of strength, and it's not going to break. It's not going to break unless you're using laser. But as far as pressure, it's not going to break. The cubic zirconium, you're able to break it with a tiny little hammer. Because glass, nothing. Tiny little hammer, boop, fake, broken. You do use the same hammer for a diamond, nothing happens. It may break the di- it may break the hammer. Bemet. This is a Jew. This is a Jew at the end of days. Before the 15 days of darkness that will come, the Rambam says, everyone is going to have the opportunity to do tshuva. Everyone is going to have the opportunity to see the emet. But this emet will come under an enormous amount of pressure. Some people are going to be able to see the emet in a shiur with five people. Some people are going to have to see the emet through cancer. Some people are going to have to see the emet on YouTube. Some people are going to see the falsehood and think it's a met because they see it in a church and a rabbi speaking. So Hashem is making it very obvious what's a met and what's falsehood. If you're seeing a rabbi inside a church, it's falsehood. You don't need me to tell you that. And if you believe that the rabbi speaking in a church is just because he's really kind and really giving and really welcoming and 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 really friendly and he wants world peace and all of that stuff you are an abomination just like him and you will end up in the same villa and get home right next to him with your world peace and all that stuff together over there why because you are so far away from the truth that even if it punched you in the face you're not going to be able to see it why because it doesn't require much of a brain to understand that anything that goes on inside of a church is not a mint. The people have been killing us, murdering us in cold blood for 2,000 years. Now you want them to be our friends? 
Oh, now we're friendly. Now, now their Mashiach is our Mashiach. Is some is is, is everyone paying attention to history? You don't, you don't have to go back two thousand years. Go back seventy. Go back twenty. Go back last week. Go back to what I experienced this morning in some court with an anti-Semite judge. Go and see what happens with these anti-Semitism. Go and understand what's happening in the world. They don't like us. And if they say they like you, it's simply because they want to convert you. They like what the potential you have as a Catholic, as a Christian. They like the potential. And that's why Donald Trump said in a recent program that the evangelical Christians are much more excited and appreciative, appreciative of him opening the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. The evangelical Christians, the number one biggest missionaries on planet Earth to Avodah Zarah, they're excited about Donald Trump and company opening the U.S. Embassy. Why are they, why are they excited, Rabotai? Because they all of a sudden want to convert to Judaism? Because they all want to go pray at the Kotel? No. They're excited because they see this is prime this is prime ground. This is everyone's a, everyone is a candidate for their Abu Dazara. And they're excited. Why? Because now we have a perfect costume for the for the wolf. We have a perfect costume for the wolf. What is it? A sheep. The perfect costume for the for the wolf that's looking for sheep is a sheep. So now it looks like we just opened an embassy. We open an embassy inside Jerusalem. Inside Jerusalem. We're friends, no? No president has done it before. No one has done it before. Everybody before and before and before and before and before. Make, we, we deleted the fact that they killed us for 2,000 years. We deleted it. We deleted it. Their book, their own book says that their job in the world is to convert Jews to Christianity. We deleted that. We deleted the fact that it says in their book that only 144,000 Jews will actually survive the end of days and only the Christians will survive. We deleted that. We deleted the fact that they say that their that their their uh, their uh, J.C. Penny guy is actually God too, and uh, and and their God had sex with a woman. We deleted that. Like it's not in the New Testament. We're pretending like all of these things don't exist. And, why? Because they have a building. Because they, they bought some real estate in Jerusalem. And now all, all of the people that are ignorant, all of the people that are just completely far away from the truth, what are they doing? Instead of fighting against this and saying, no, stay away, you stay in your land, we stay in our land, we don't need you. What are they saying? Oh, Baruch Haba, Baruch Haba. They give them the platform. They say, call a kavod for your speeches. They bring them to our shuls. We forgot. We forgot what it means to Shiloh Asani Goy. We forgot. And under what, under what circumstance, mental circumstance, are we doing this? Under the false belief that we love God. You will rarely find a Jew living in the world today that doesn't say, I love God. The fact that 90% do not even keep Shabbat, and in the best case scenario, in the best neighborhoods, maybe 70% keep Shabbat. Don't keep Shabbat. But in reality, most Jews don't keep Shabbat, the very basic foundation of Judaism, simply because they don't know the difference between right and wrong yet, because there's not enough teachers telling them the truth. But if you ask an average Jew, do you love God? Even if he has a cross on his neck, and he's a missionary for Christianity, I'll tell you, absolutely, I love God. Even if he, does, if he drives his car on Shabbat while eating a, a pig sandwich. I'll tell you, I love God. I, look, I have in the background, I have a song. We love you. All types of songs, we love God. On Shabbat, he's driving on the beach where everyone's naked. And he has in the background songs about how much he loves God. The average Jew is convinced he loves God. Whether it be Breslev or Chabad. Or regular secular Jew, or any everywhere else, it's everywhere. We have this false belief that we love God. So when you teach them to fear God, like hey, hey, I'm past the fear. I love God. I love God so much. I love God more than you. I love God more than you. I love God so much. I talk to him. I talk to God. He talks to me. I talk to God. I know what God wants for me. 
I know. Somebody told me recently. I know what God wants for me. I know what He wants. I know exactly what He wants. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know. You know. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know, but you know. I know what God wants for me. I love God and God loves me. So it's time for us to talk about love. What is love? What is love between us as human beings, man and his wife, brothers, children and their parents, and ultimately, what is love between us and Hashem Barach? It's time for us to understand what we're actually saying when we say I love you. Do we mean I love you or do we mean I love me? But I'm just saying I love you because it sounds better. It sounds kind of odd to say, hey, honey, I love me. I love me so much, honey. It's what a one. You know what? Great food. I love me. Sounds kind of weird, right? You're probably going to show you the door. Honey, you know what? Great present. I love me. What? Sounds weird, but in reality, that's what we're supposed to be saying. Why? Because all we love is ourselves. You rarely find a person that even understands the definition of love. Anyone wants to volunteer? Be a hero and define love? Chavod. Okay. Getting there. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. All right, you had a question or you want to continue? Yeah, I had a question. Yes. So the argument is that the Torah is from God. So he says if it's from God, why is it called Torah Moshe? I don't know what to answer him. Because why is it called Torah Moshe? Because Moshe Rabbeinu was so humble. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that Moshe Rabbeinu left his body on earth, on Mount Sinai, and went up to Shemaim. His Neshama went up to Shemaim. We can barely say the word Shemaim. He went to Shemaim. Moshe Rabbeinu arrived there and the Malachim, each one of them, made of complete fire, different levels of fire, 60 times greater than the fire that we could even understand or comprehend from this world, 60 different types of fire, that the Gemara in Masechet Chagigah says that when these angels get close to the Shekhinah, whatever that means, because there's no physicality to the Shekhinah, from the fear they have from Hashem Barach, they sweat fire. The Shkmara in Masechet Chagas says, they sweat fire, and that's the fire that lights Genom. But the angels are scared to death. From who? From Hashem. We, we call him our friend. We love him. He's our buddy. He helps me, uh, uh, you know, do my stuff. Win the stock market. Win poker tournaments. Uh, find a girlfriend and a boyfriend and a dog. Such is the difference in, between the truth and our stupidity sometimes. So Moshe Rabbeinu arrives and the Malachim say to Hashem, what is the son of a woman doing in the place of heavenly beings? Hashem says to Moshe, answer them. Answer them. Moshe says, I'm scared. They're going to burn me. I'm scared they're going to burn me. They're fired. Each one is the size of a planet. What do you think the Malachim are like you and me? Each one of them is the size of Earth, Mars, Pluto, giants. They're not little, uh, little friends. Hey, how are you? How are you? Where do you work? Oh, what do you do on weekends? How, how many kids do you have? Do you like this tie? It's not, not one of those conversations, Rabotai. He's an angel, size of giants. Moshe Rabbeinu is scared to death. He says to Hashem, they're going to burn me from their Kedushah. 
Hashem says, hold on to my throne of glory, I'll protect you, answer them. Moshe Rabbeinu, now that he knows he has the protection of Hashem Yitbarach, responds and he says, I'm here to collect the Torah. I'm here to receive the Torah. Torah? Hashem, you're not going to give the Torah that you wrote 974 generations before you created us and the rest of the world to someone that could sin against you, to someone that says, I love you while they're sinning. They love you, but they sin against you. How are you going to give them the Torah? Hashem says to Moshe, Moshe, answer them. Moshe, now that he has, he's got Hashem. He's like, okay. It says in the Torah, Hashem told me, it says in the Torah, Kabelet avicha ve'et imecha. You have to respect your mother and your father. Do you have a mother and a father, Mr. Angel, the size of earth? No. It says in the Torah, you have to eat kosher. Do you eat? Do you eat, Mr. Angel, the size of Pluto? No. It says in the Torah, I can't wear shatnez. Do you wear anything? You're fire. You're going to burn the shatnez. All the, obviously, Hashem says the first commandment in the Ten Commandments, I am God that took you out of Egypt. Did any one of you stay in Egypt as slaves? Mr. Angels are the size of, uh, of the stars and the sun? No. The, the, the angels? They liked his answers. Ashrecha. Each one of them gave him a present. They liked him so much, each one of the angels, including the Malach Hamavit, came to Moshe and gave him a present. They became his friends. They became his friends. He put his life on the line to come. I'm here to collect the Torah. It's ours. But now, the Malach Hamavit didn't really understand what was going on. He thought that Moshe was just going to, you know, going to learn a few things, go down. He didn't realize he actually get something. So after that, when Moshe left with the Torah, per se, whatever that means, he didn't get an actual book, but he got a Torah, he left, the Malach Hamavit realized something is strange here. He went up to Shemaim, he says, where is it? Where's the Torah? Where's the Torah? I, I used to be one of the Otsarim, used to be one of the treasures in Shemaim. There's a few treasures in Shemaim. There was Shabbat that was in the treasure chest. There is Yirat Hashem. The treasure chest of a fear of Hashem is in the treasure chest. And there was the Torah. So he says, where's the Torah? Nobody knows. He asked the heavens, where's the Torah? We don't know. He asked the sun, where's the Torah? I don't know. He goes to Hashem, Hashem, where's the Torah? He goes, oh, it's, uh, Moshe has it. Ben Amram. The son of Amram has it. He comes to Moshe. Where's the Torah? I don't have anything. Can I carry such a Torah that Hashem wrote black fire on white fire? You want me to carry the Torah? Hashem comes out. He says, Moshe, you're fibbing. You're fibbing. You have the Torah, but because you're humble. You humbled yourself to say that you're not even worthy of carrying my Torah. Because of that... I'm going to call the Torah after you. Because you humbled yourself and understood that the Torah is greater than any of the creations in the world. Greater than you yourself, Moshe, and all of Am Yisrael and everything else. And you minimize yourself. You humbled yourself to not even say, I have the Torah. I got it. I just spoke to all the angels. I won. Instead of going around like that with your chest up high, you said, no, me, I have the Torah. Nothing. What Torah I have? You humbled yourself, I'm going to name the Torah after you. And that person now has an answer. So now, Rabotai, there's all of the answers for any of the questions that you can possibly want and don't want are in the Torah. There's nothing that doesn't have an answer. And even the things that don't have an answer per se, there's a reason why they don't have an answer. So, one of the most important questions that a person needs to ask themselves during their life is, do I know what love is? Because people scream out, I love you, 24 hours a day. 
people even say and swear to themselves that they love somebody. People believe they love each other. But yet, you ask them, why'd you get divorced? Ah, you know, fell out of love. We don't love each other. There's no love, there's nothing. Wait, so how'd you get married? Oh, I used to love her. Wait, so love stopped? The love just went away? What is it, a headache? When you can catch it in a, in a kindergarten, it's a flu? You, you buy it in a store, maybe CVS has a sale on it? How do you get this love? Well, it's temporary only. So how do you know when it's going to run out? Does it have like one of those toys you, you spin in the back? You spin in the back, three, eh, 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 five years. Eh, eh, uh, five and a half years. Eh, 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 six years broken. What, what, how, how do you know? What is this? That's what this Mishnah is about. It's time for us to understand the difference between love and all the other shtuyot that people think. Kol ava. Nathan. It says, any love that depends on a specific cause, when that cause is gone, the love is gone. But if the love does not depend on the cause, it will never cease. It will never end. What sort of love depended on a specific cause that we have in the Torah? The love of Amnon for Tamar. Amnon was, both of them were the sons of David. They were half brother and sister. And Amnon lusted for his half sister, telling her that he loves her. But yet after he rapes her, he immediately started hating her. Not loving her anymore. He got what he wanted finally. And now he hated her. Since that was a love that depended on a specific cause. And what was a love in a Torah that does not depend on a specific cause? The love of David and Yonatan. The love of David and Yonatan. Two men. Now, chas v'shalom, let it not even enter your brain like this Rasha Merusha Dwek and all of the imbeciles that follow him to think for a second that you're even allowed to think about homosexuality having anything to do between the relationship of, of David and Yonatan. To say it is embarrassing. To say it. To think it. I don't know if somebody could make it out of this world just thinking that it's a, such a, there's, there's a level of truth to it. It's most despicable that somebody thinks that the person that Hashem decided to make the fourth pillar of the Merkava, the fourth part of the Merkava to carry the Shekhinah, the Mashiach comes from him, people actually think, oh, maybe he was homosexual. Why? Because they don't know how to read Torah. They don't know how to read Torah. And they learn from rabbis who also don't know how to read Torah. They know how to read from their own opinions. So we talked about this Dwick some months ago, maybe even a year ago, when he came out with a despicable shiur talking about how homosexuality is the greatest thing that's happened in recent generations, even though it's against Hashem, against His Torah, and against anything that's pure. And he used one of the examples as the relationship between Yonatan and David. So to kill the elephant in the room, and understand, so in case people don't watch the entire three-hour or six-hour shiur, let's just deal with this right now and understand exactly what the verse means. So you understand and eliminate any of this filth out of your brain forever. Now his whole foundation for what he said was because the love between Yonatan and David was extraordinary. If you look at the book of Samuel, the book of Samuel has several different interesting verses and conversations between Yonatan and David of how from the minute that they met each other, 
they became like soulmates. Even though technically they had all the reasons in the world to hate each other. Because Yonatan was the son of Shaul and was the one that was supposed to become the next king. But instead, David became the next king. So he was a natural enemy of Shaul. Shaul tried to kill him. Shaul tried to kill him. Even though Shaul was a tzaddik, he had ruach shtut, he had uh, some yetzah enter his mind, and he got to the mistaken belief that David was actually trying to kill him, trying to steal the kinghood. So he said, oh, he's a rodef. He's trying to kill me, so I have to kill him. And he spent many, many times trying to kill David, and David, in order to prove himself that he's not only doesn't want to kill him, he actually loves him. He actually cares about him. He's a fellow Jew. He's Shaul. It's not, he's not trying to do anything. He actually was able to kill Shaul several times and did not kill him. And proved to him, listen, I could have killed you here. I have, I cut a piece of your clothes while you were sleeping. Meaning, instead of cutting a piece of your clothes, I could have cut your throat instead. And I didn't. To show you I'm not your enemy. But why, boy, your enemy, I'll kill you. And he did this several times. Now, Yonatan was technically supposed to become the king after Shaul died. But instead of focusing on being the next king, what did he focus on? Protecting David. Even though it's going his own, against his own father, even though it's going against himself. It's going against himself. Imagine, you have an opportunity to become CEO. But you see somebody else, it's better fit. Better fit. Now, no one on earth, no one on earth will say, you know what? He's better fit. I'm going to stay the busboy. I'm going to stay the janitor. I'm going to stay the uh, regular employee or even the vice president and let him go and be CEO. No one. Why? Because we're all selfish. We're all selfish. We don't care who's better to be the CEO. If we got the opportunity, we're taking it. Even if we didn't get the opportunity, we'll kill somebody just to take it. It's one of the uh, corporate policies in America today. You know, oh, the corporate world. Kill people on your way to the top. So, Yonatan, instead of focusing on himself, he focused on saving David's life. And many times you'll see in the book of Samuel how extraordinary this relationship was. Now, after he died, David Amelech says the following. In the book of Samuel 2, chapter 1, verse 26, David Melech says after he sees that his brother Yonatan, Jewish brother, Yonatan died, he says, I'm distressed over you, my brother Yonatan, you were so pleasant to me. Your love was more wondrous to me than the love of women. So from here, the imbeciles that don't know how to read the Midrash, that don't know how to read commentary and decide to be their own Midrash, decide, oh, look, David loves Jonathan more than women. So, heard from Rav Nisim again who saw it himself in the Baal Mishkan Betzalel. Mishkan Betzalel wrote an extraordinary commentary on this explaining this in the best way that I know. He says, David Amelech is not saying to Yonatan, you, your love was more wondrous to me than the love of a woman. A single woman. It says love of women, white women. Why? Where, which tribe was Yonatan from? Benjamin. Shaul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Who was Benjamin's mother? Who was Benjamin's mother? Rachel. Now Rachel, Alea Shalom, loved her sister. So much that even though Yaakov wanted to marry her, 
Yaakov wanted to marry Rachel. Yaakov wanted to marry Rachel, but her father wasn't exactly a tzaddik, and he switched. He switched, and she said, if I tell Yaakov that it's really not me marrying him, he's marrying my sister, first and foremost, my sister will be embarrassed. Yeah, but uh, let her be embarrassed. I'm going to lose my husband. She didn't have any guarantee he's going to marry her too. And she said, oh, if, if my sister, also Kodesh Kodeshim, but, but my sister, it's not me. If she marries Yaakov, if Leah marries Yaakov, okay, she marries Yaakov, that means Rachel, who's she going to marry? A Sav. So instead of marrying the biggest tzaddik in the world, the one that she sees from prophecy, he's going to start Am Yisrael. He's going to start Am Yisrael. What am I going to marry? I'm going to marry Esav. Originally, it was supposed to be, the Midrash says, that six of the Shvatim, six of the tribes, were supposed to come from Yaakov, and six from Esav. Esav ruined it, all twelve came from Yaakov. But Rachel didn't know this at this time. She's saying, oh, wait a minute. She's going to get embarrassed. I'd rather lose my Olam Abba. I'd rather lose my Olam Azeh. I'd rather lose everything just so my dear sister does not get embarrassed. Why? Because I love her. Because I love her. Yeah, but she doesn't even know that you're doing it for her. Doesn't make a difference. Later on, she's not even going to be grateful about it. Doesn't matter. You're not going to get any good for it. Doesn't make a difference. Why? Love is free. Love is free. Love doesn't want anything back. Love doesn't have a price or return policy. Love doesn't end. Love just exists. And I love my sister and I'm willing to destroy my life in this world and the next for her. And that's why Rabotai Yekarim, David Melech said to Yonatan, the love that you had for me, that you, you, you put yourself second to me. I'm not even related to you. You, instead of being the next king and killing me, a million opportunities that you had because, hey, you're, you're, only, you're listening to your father. He's the Gdolador currently. It's not like he's uh, Esav. He's Tzaddik. Shaul is a Tzaddik. Listen to you. Instead of listening to your father, what'd you do? You protected me. You gave up your own right to be a king for me. The love that you had for me, the love we had between each other, is extraordinary to me. It's not natural. I know you, Yonatan, you got that midah from who? From the women. From who? From Rachel. Because you came from her. It's not a human thing that a regular person can have. A regular person cannot have the love of Rachel without being related to Rachel. So the love that I had, that you had, that's not natural. It's not a normal thing. You for sure got the signature, you're from Rachel. And that's astounding. That's astounding. And that's why when the time of the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, Hashem was planning on destroying everyone. Hashem Yachem. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says the Bet HaMikdash was not destroyed for any other reason other than Chilul Shabbat. Chilul Shabbat. But the Gemara says, wait a minute. Some people kept Shabbat. Why, well, everybody violated Shabbat? Some people kept Shabbat. Hashem says, yes, but the ones that kept Shabbat didn't tell the Mechalel Shabbat to do tshuva. Didn't tell them to do tshuva. They considered also Mechalel Shabbat. They didn't rebuke. Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 118, says, because they didn't rebuke, that's why he destroyed the Bet HaMikdash. Now he was planning on destroying everything, Hashem Yachem. Avraham Avinu comes to Hashem and says, Hashem, why are you doing this? They're my sons, you promised me good. They're my descendants, why are you doing this? He didn't listen to him. Yitzchak comes, no Hashem, my descendants. He didn't listen to him. Yaakov, no Hashem, didn't listen to him. Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Hashem, starts crying to Hashem, Hashem, they woke me up, they took me out of Olam Abba, or Gan Eden, they told me you're destroying my, my, my kids. Why Hashem? He didn't listen to him. When did he stop destroying? When Rachel came. 
Rachel came to Hashem and said, Hashem, what's the big deal? What? They, they worshipped idols? They, they, they forsaken the love for you? You told them to keep Shabbat. And they acted like idol worshippers that don't keep Shabbat. They told you I love you, but it was fake. Okay. Big deal. But you don't have pay. Look what I did. I gave up a husband. I gave up my ulama ba. I gave up my ulama ze. I didn't know what's going to happen. Hashem says to you, I'll listen. To you, Rachel, that has such a love, I'll listen to you. To you, I will listen. So, Rabutai, real love has extraordinary power. And the Mishnah here tells us that it's David Melech was trying to teach us through the conversation with Yonatan what it really means to love. Because if it's real love, it has nothing to do with anything physical. So first and foremost, the Chazon Ish, Allah Shalom, says what the secular people call love to us, it's called karet. What the secular people believe is love, and that was in his time. And today, I think it's even including many of the religious. What most people think love is, to a Jew with Yirat Shemaim, it's a sin of karet. Meaning it's one of the 36 sins that it's better that you die and not make the sin. Simply because we think that love has anything to do with lust. If you look at Sefer Bereshit, you go into the Maaseh of Yitzchak Avinu. Yitzchak Avinu, Parashat Chayesara, after his mom dies, at the end of the parasha, in chapter 24, it says, It says, Yitzchak brought into his tent, into the tent of Sarah, his mother. Who did he bring? He brought Rivka. Rivka that he just met, the Eliezer, the loyal servant of Avram Avinu, his father, brought her from the horrible family and life that she was in, but she was a tzaddikah. He brought her to marry Yitzchak. So after he saw, the first time that they meet, she asks Eliezer, who is he? Who is that person? And the servant, meaning Eliezer, says, he is my master. So immediately when she, she realized, this is Yitzchak, this is my future husband, it says, she then took the veil and covered herself. Immediately when she saw, this is going to be my future husband, she increased her modesty even more. She was already normally modest, but she increased it even more. So he understands that she is ready to be a married person. A lot of people tell me all the time, yeah, you know, he doesn't really keep mitzvot yet, but he says that once we get married, he's going to do tshuva. You know, she doesn't keep Shabbat yet, but she says that it's going to be much easier once we get married. Now, any rabbi with a brain in his head and a little bit of yirat shamayim says that such a thing, such a shiduch is not allowed. You're not allowed to go on a shiduch with someone that's not religious. You're not allowed, again, if you keep Torah and mitzvot and you found somebody that is very attractive but they don't keep Torah and mitzvot but they say they will. They say they will. They say, listen, right now I'm not keeping Torah and mitzvot. Right now I go to clubs. Right now I go to casinos. Right now I go to strip clubs. Right now I steal for a living. Right now I murder a few people once a week. Right now I do a bunch of different things against Hashem. 
But once they get married, I'm going to turn into Avraham Avinu. All the money I got from the mafia, I'm going to put it for, for I'm going to make, uh, you know, all the... I'm going to be tzaddik. I just need to get married. I need a woman that's going to be strong for me. No rabbi with one ounce of Yerat Shemaim will ever allow any of his students to even think that's okay. No father or mother will ever allow their child to go out with somebody like that. Why? Because it simply does not work. It simply does not work. And now, instead of taking a, a, uh, being already at risk, being living in this world in the first place, now you've pretty much assured your, your child, whether it be a daughter or a son, that they're going to have a very, very difficult life. Why? Because a lot of people say things, but they don't really mean it. My father explains it best when he says it's because words don't cost anything. They're free. People will say anything to get what they want. I'll be religious. I'll be Baba Sali. I'll be Moshe Rabbeinu. I'll be whatever you want me to be. Just do what I want. I'll be whatever you want to be. And I'll let you be what you want to be. Just do, just, just, just do what I want. This is what the Arabs do in order to lure innocent, naive Israeli girls to become their wives. There are over 60,000 Israeli girls married to Muslims in Israel. 60,000. Now, if you said 60,000 Americans, it means nothing. 60,000 people die every day from certain diseases in this country because there's 400 million of them. But we say 60,000 for Am Yisrael, it's a lot. We don't have that many people. So we say 60,000 of our, of our daughters, our sisters, are married to our enemy. How did this happen? How it happened? It happened because the Arabs come to them and tell them, Look, this car, you see this Bentley? It's for you. You see this castle? It's for you. You see the watch? And the diamonds and the horses and the camels, they always have camels for some reason. And this and, and, and the house in the middle, that, it's all for you, my darling. And they show them these really nice pictures of Muslims. They look so happy, they're like models. And, and, and they have like a wife next to them, that's a pretend wife, uh, that's, uh, that's happy with her jalabiya. And they look happy and happy. And ha- she doesn't know she's the ninth wife. That he doesn't tell her. She doesn't know that all the happy, happy, happy promises are only here when we're around other people. But as soon as we're married and I take you back to the motherland, to the Kuwait or to Iraq or some other cave in the world, what happens? He beats the hell out of her and tells her, now you're my wife, you have nowhere else to go. Now you're wife number 15, 12, 13, make do. Be available when I want you to be. What about the car and the house? Yeah, that's, that's just for show. It's too late now. You think I'm joking? There's entire igunim, there's entire organizations, entire organizations built, Jewish organizations built to help rescue these poor women. These poor women that are running away from these Arabs. Some of these people that are running away are actually Arabs themselves. They're not even Jewish. They're also running away from the, from the Arab husbands because they're so violent and treacherous. Like? So, but today in the world, you ask people about them, everything I just said to you, no, he's making it up. He's making it up. He's crazy. He's crazy. We're peaceful people. We're peaceful religion. So Rabbutai Karim, it's very, very important to understand the difference between truth and lies. Unfortunately, most people don't want to listen to me. They want to listen to their own experience, which is much more expensive because my lesson is free. I don't make anything up. I have no interest whatsoever in conspiracies or to make up stories, and I'm not looking for fans. I care less if you're a fan. As a matter of fact, it's probably better if you hate me. Just believe what I say because I'm not making it up. Because the people that always told me they love me in my life, with the exception of a few that are still there, like my wife and my family, everybody else is a liar. No one loves. They love themselves. You don't need to love me. Just listen to what I'm telling you. It's true. It's true. You want to check it? Go check it. 
Everything is backed up. The point is, Rabotai, it's a very expensive lesson. Ignorance is an expensive lesson. And that's why 60,000 Jewish girls right now are paying this expensive lessons. They have little Muhammads running around their house, but they realize they don't want it. But it's too late. It's too late that their son is going to be the next terrorist bomber. It's too late. Some of these terrorists are actually Jews and they don't even know it. They don't even know. They hate Jews, but they don't know they're Jews themselves. Based on Allah. So, in our Torah, modesty is king. A woman that is not modest is not someone that's married just to her husband. She's married to everyone that looks at her. A woman that refuses to be modest is a woman that refuses to be a loyal wife. Why? Because loyalty means you not only are going to be intimate with your husband. Loyalty also means that you're only going to be in the mind of your husband and not everybody else's. If you allow yourself to walk around in such a way that every average Joe can imagine what you look like naked in two seconds because you've already given him half the pie, you're not loyal to your husband. You're loyal to the attention you like that people give you. So, Rivka, Kodesh Kodeshim, that she is, a living Sefer Torah, what is the first thing she does as soon as she realizes that her husband is down the street? She immediately covers herself even more. What, she wasn't covered? Of course she was covered. But she covered herself even more. Why? I want to show you, Yitzchak, I'm ready to be married. I'm not interested in anything else. I'm ready to be married. I'm ready to be a wife. I'm not looking for attention from the Walmart clerk. I'm not looking for attention from the painter. Oh, wow, it's a nice dress on you have, uh, miss. It's a nice dress you have, miss. How many kids you have? Wow, it doesn't look like it. Why are you talking to the painter? Why are you in the house alone with the painter? Where's your husband? Oh, he's working. Okay, so the painter should be working where he is. You're not allowed to be alone in the house with a strange man. I don't care if he's the painter. I don't care if he's your brother. Not allowed. So now after that, Yitzchak understands this is, this is a holy of holy. So Yitzchak brings her into the tent of Sarai, his mother. He marries Rivka. She became his wife. And only then it says, and he loved her. Today's world, you say, wait a minute, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the little baby carriage. Now there's a little song from 1920s over there. Love, marriage, baby carriage. Wait, hold on a second. It's opposite. It's hot. What are you doing? Why don't you check it out? Date her for a little while. Kick the wheels a little bit. See what happens. Test it out. No. What are you doing? It's hot. It's hot is teaching us a lesson of life, all you youngsters. Before you got married, you don't even know what love is. You can tell yourself and her and him that you love them until you're blue in the face. It means zero. All you have is lust. You don't even know what the definition of love is until your first fight. Until you've gone through hell together. Until she doesn't look so good. Until he's in the hospital. Until he's broke. Until she's broke. Until something happens, you don't even know what love is, Bichlal. You don't even know what love is. What do you, I love her. What love her? What do you love about her? What do you know about her? What's her favorite color? Uh, uh, what's, her, what, what, what's her dream in life? Uh, she loves me. Why does she love you? What, what makes her love? She makes me steak. Okay, so does the guy at the restaurant. I mean, he loves you? He made you steak also. He loves you also? She made you food that makes you love you? He makes you food, that means he loves you. He bought you jewelry. Your father bought you jewelry. The strange guy that uh, wanted to uh, rape you bought you jewelry. The Arab bought you jewelry. Why? That means they love you? Well, what's it? It's Hakavin who says, I married Rivka. I married Rivka, then I loved her. 
Then I love them. Why? Because love takes time all the time. This love at first sight nonsense, it's lust at first sight. You see somebody, you want them. It's lust. That's karit. That's karit. It's not, it's not love. It's karit. So, it's important to know the difference. It's important to know the difference. And we're going to go back to the same parasha because we're going to see how does Rivka and Yitzchak took this belief system, this full understanding of the Emet, and utilized it with their children, Yaakov and Esav. So the Mishnah says, Kol ava tluya bedavar, batel davar betela ava. Any love that depends on a specific cause. When that cause is gone, the love is gone. Rashi says, it establishes the profound, this Mishnah establishes the profound principle that love, which is based on anything besides emotional closeness and true friendship, will simply not last. It will not endure. Superficial motivations create only temporary results. What is this like? This is no different than the desire for anything else in the world, even something as simple as desire for food. Now, after you look at the steak, if you haven't eaten all day, if you like steak, they tell you, you want a steak? Yeah, I love steak. I love steak. Steak sounds delicious. Look at Amos right now. He's, he's, he's looking, he's, he's thinking about steak, right? I love steak. I love steak. Now, after you finish eating the steak, all 16, 20 ounces of it, like it's half a cow, after you finish eating the steak, do you still talk about the steak and how much you love it? Oh, wow, what a steak. What a nice steak. You know, a steak. What a steak. I love that steak. It had such a good personality, that steak. That steak had a good personality. We, we, we matched this, me and the steak. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about the steak tomorrow also. The minute you take your last bite, the minute you take your last bite, that steak is already a forgotten memory. It's a famous, funny saying, but it's true. A lot of Musar from the saying. Does a fisherman like fish? Does a fisherman love fish? Does a fisherman love fish? You ask every fisherman in the world. What's your favorite thing to do? Fish. What do you love? Fish. What do you eat? Fish. Wait, hold on a second. If you love the fish, why do you eat them? Rabbi Yisrael Misalat, who I'm sure preceded this saying, once heard a few people talking, and they were talking about nonsense, they were talking about food. And one of the guys said, Oh, I love chicken. I love chicken. Rabbi Yisrael who is a living truth, says, you don't love chicken. If you love chicken, you wouldn't eat it. You wouldn't slaughter it. You love yourself. You love that it makes your fat belly fatter. That's what you love. The chicken, if you love the chicken, why are you killing it? Why are you slaughtering it? Yeah, but it's kosher. Okay, it's kosher. doesn't mean you love it, though. Oh, okay. You could justify it as much as you want. Maybe the chicken wants to eat you. Yo Gilgul also. The chicken's going to come to you and say, Yo Gilgul, I'm going to eat you. I love you. I love you, Amos. I'm going to eat you. Fish and Shadikim. The fish and Shadikim. So the lion says, Amos, Yo Gilgul, let me eat you. I love you. I love you. We don't love chicken. We don't love fish. We love what they make us feel which is no more hunger. That's what we love. As soon as we finish eating them, we never thinking about it them again. There's never a person on earth that's a normal person. I'm talking about normal people. Of course, there's an exception to every case. It's always going to be an unusual circumstance. I'm not talking about those crazy people. I'm talking about regular people. Regular people, if there's some left in the world. No one talks about the meal they had on Monday th three months ago. Oh, you know, three months ago, I had the steak, 
and it had this anchovies on it or something, and it had this mushrooms on it, and it had the uh, palo on it, and it had vegetables on it, and it had this on it. And no one talks about that. Why? He's talking about the steak he wants to eat now. He forgot about the steak from three months ago. Because once the desire is satiated, it's finished, it's gone, the feeling is gone, it's like it never happened. That's lust. Rabotai, that is lust. That is exactly, that satiation of hunger for food is no different once it's satisfied. Once the hunger is satisfied, it's no different than lust being satisfied. And that's why people get divorced. The Rav Hirsch, Allah Shalom, says marriages that break up, marriages that break up, it's only because people confuse lust with love. That's it. It's the only reason why marriages break. There's nothing else. There's no other reason. No, but we had different beliefs. Okay, so why didn't you figure that out before you got married? Oh, he, 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 he likes men. Okay, so how come he married a woman? Oh, she likes dogs. I don't want dogs. So how come you didn't figure it out before you got married? How come she doesn't like you more than the dog? And to say, you know what? I like dogs, but I love you. So the dog can stay in the picture. The dog can stay in my neighbor's house. Why doesn't she have love for you more than the dog? Why, does she have, why doesn't he have more love for you than his career? And people, when you ask them those questions, hey, hey. They take it person like you're attacking them. Why are you attacking me? No, why don't you ask those questions before you got married? Because our Torah says that if you have a mate, that means that Hashem Himself put it together. They ask, what well, the ask, what is Hashem doing since He created the world? What is He doing? So it says a portion of the day He learns Torah, he plays with Torah. Portions of the day He plays with the Leviathan. He has a little pet, Leviathan. There's a pet, Leviathan, he plays with him. So, what, there's one Midrash, my wife told me, there's one Midrash says, he plays with him for 25% of the day, with his little Leviathan. Little Leviathan, it's half the world. Yeah. Leviathan is a giant fish. Huge, huge whale. Some say it's, uh, I don't know, it's an unimaginable size. It's half the world, 970 miles long. There's different, different commentaries on how big it really is. But this Leviathan, originally Hashem created two. But then he killed one of them because he knew if they procreated, they would destroy the world. So he only left one. And that Leviathan is what we're going to eat as the festive meal when Mashiach comes. Does that exist right now in the ocean? Yes, it's my stomach. <laughs> okay, it exists in the ocean. Yes. Yes, Hashem created two. He killed one. One left. Yeah, but when did he create one? Creation. It says. And Bereshit. Why is that so difficult to understand? No, because you said that Hashem left the star. I thought it was in, in uh, what? Why would Hashem play with the fish? No, no Why not? <laughs> What's so hard for you guys to understand? I don't understand. <laughs> it's a pet. It doesn't literally mean he plays with him like you play with your dog or something, but that's what the Midrash says. He plays. I don't go. You have to understand, Rabotai. Let me explain. How come you can't see it? Go into the ocean, the middle of the Atlantic, go all the way to the bottom, about three, four, five, six miles into the bottom. Go live your time. Maybe he'll answer. Maybe he's an answer. Now, Rabotai, you have to understand. Let me explain. My Rav told me this. My Rav told me this, and I follow my Rav. What are you saying? My Rav's Bo Hashem Talmit Chacham. He knows what he's talking about. He Bo Hashem. Anyone that knows three thousand books by heart, to me, Moshe Rabenu. Now, you have to understand. To me, to me, to me, Rav Ovadia, Moshe Rabenu, Avram Avinu. I don't know uh, anyone you mention. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Ezra Ben Horkinos. It's all the same. Anyone that knows the entire Torah, to me it's so much greater than any level of understanding that I can have. It's the same. So when one of them, whether it be Rabu Vadya from just a few years ago, 
or from Rabbi Akiva from 2,000 years ago, or Moshe Rabbeinu 3,000 years ago, or David HaMelech, or anyone you mention in between all of those times, when any one of them writes something in a book, and they say, listen, there's a Leviathan, and he's the size of uh, half the world, or 978 miles, and some, some people say, and he lives, and, and they say, it, to me, pst, it's as good as gold. Why? Who am I to want to dispute them? Oh, no, no, it doesn't make sense to me. What do you? Who are you with your little puny mind that's the size of an ant? Who are you? That's the problem, Rabotai. We don't want to accept things unless we can understand them. But we don't understand the people that are saying it are so great and so much greater than us that sometimes you say, you know what, I don't understand it. But if he said it, that's enough. If he said it, that's enough. Little kid, little kid. I, he doesn't want to listen to Ima and Abba. He doesn't want to listen to Ima and Abba. Why? Because he wants to go play. He wants to go play in the middle of the street right when the cars are coming. He wants to go play in the street. Definitely, especially when the cars are coming. He wants to see how cool it looks like under the car when they're driving. He wants to go. He wants to run under the car. But when Ima says, no, don't go. Don't go. He says, I don't know why Ima's so crazy right now. I think she should take a chill pill. But it sounds like she's serious. I'm just going to take her word for it. Why? She's greater than me, either physically <laughs> or spiritually. Whichever one you want to take. I'm going to listen to him. I'm not going to go run in the middle of the street. I'm going to take a word for it. Even the little kid can understand this. The little kid can understand. So you have to understand, there's certain things, there's certain midrashim, there's certain things that it says in the Torah that are beyond our comprehension. Don't delve too much into it to try to understand it. Like the story I told you, the story of the shield today, that Moshe Rabbeinu was in Gan Eden. Is that any more understandable than a half of the uh, Leviathan that's the size of a planet? No! A human going to Shemaim and, 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 and having a debate with angels, that's normal to you guys? The fact, that a human, the fact that a human being can come from a putrid seed, a seed, a putrid, disgusting little seed, and those little disgusting little seed has... The DNA, the makeup, the mind, the everything that's needed for you to be here. That makes sense to you? That makes sense to you? Like, what are you trying to make sense out of everything? That makes sense to you? That a putrid seed becomes a human being that's now talking to you in a language that you happen to understand? That, go make sense of that. Forget the Leviathan. Go make sense of the putrid seed. Forget the living. Let's go make sense of the putrid seed. Let's just now all debate. Oh, how does the putrid seed is now talking to us? And now this putrid seed eventually is going to go into the world, and the ground that he came from starts eating him, and he becomes one with the ground, and the old maggots make lunch and dinner from him. That makes sense to you? That makes sense to you? Why does it make sense to you? How does that make sense to you more than the Leviathan? Huge, yes. There are many things that are hidden in plain sight. There are many things in the world and in the universe that are hidden in plain sight simply because you're not looking carefully. Simply because you're not, you don't know what to look for. There are many, many things that we don't know anything about and they're in front of us. As a matter of fact, there is a enormous amount of money and then we'll move on to the next thing because I don't want to spend the rest of the night on this but there is an enormous billions and billions and billions of dollars being invested annually into investigating your body to figure out how to protect ourselves from disease how to cure it how to fix it and they invest an enormous of billions billions and billions of dollars researchers and people that go to school for a million years and they study this stuff all day and all night, and they give up their marriages for it, and their lives for it. And it's these labs, and buildings, and buildings, and buildings, and cities worth of buildings full of people trying to figure out your body. For years already, for decades, for centuries. And you know that only until this last year or two, this last year or two, we're talking, we're talking about many, many years, they did not even know that there's actually another organ in the body, and not only another organ in the body, the biggest organ in the body. 
the biggest organ in the body, the entire, the biggest organ in the entire body that you have was just discovered in the last year. The biggest one, the most obvious one, was just discovered in the last year. How? It's so, uh, you discover the heart, it's so much smaller. You discover the, uh, the, the lungs. You discover the, uh, the biggest one you can discover? No. They just discovered this last year. Sometimes we don't know what to look for, Rabotai. Just because you don't know something doesn't make it not true. Doesn't make it not possible. You just don't know it. That's all it means. Yes. No, it's not the brain. Brain's not the biggest organ in the body. The biggest organ in the body is the one that actually makes your blood travel throughout your entire body. It's your entire blood system. It's the skin itself, in essence, is the organ. Skin itself is actually an organ. So, okay, but this is only a recent discovery. Recent discovery. So, the point is, Rabotai, is that one of the things that you have to realize as you learn more and more Torah, especially, is that there is an enormous amount of information that you know already just by simply living you accumulate an enormous amount of information every day you're like a sponge every day you accumulate more information you accumulate that your neighbor doesn't like to wear clothes you accumulate that your job requires you to actually show up on time you accumulate that uh, you know overcooking an egg doesn't make it good you accumulate a lot of information all day you accumulate information from books you read from things you watch and so on and so forth you accumulate a lot of information and if you multiply that information times, I don't know, 70 years, 100 years that you live, you would assume that you know a lot. If you multiply that by not only 70 years, by, by 8 billion people, 8 billion people times 70. A lot of them have similar information, but a lot of them have different information. You combine all, all that into a little box. A lot of information. You combine all of that 8 billion people worth of information that's all in a box into all of the people that ever existed whether you want to calculate the existence based on Torah that's 5,778 years or based on uh, the the uh, the people that think that we came from amoebas 13.4 billion years ago whichever one you want to calculate it's irrelevant whatever world you want to live in it's irrelevant take all shh, all the information that all of the people that ever lived shh, put all in a little box right that, Rabotai, all of that information that all of them have accumulated is not even 1% of 1% of 1% of the Torah. I'm not asking you about what's possible. I'm telling you it's not even 1% of 1% of the actual information available. It's not available. So possibility, probabilities are a different subject. The point is that there's just as much information as you believe you know there's a lot to say the least there's a lot you don't know not just because it's you everybody that you don't know that's why we learn so now this Mishnah is trying to teach us something that most of the 8 billion people in the world and all of the ones that lived before them and unfortunately many of the ones that will live after them will never know even though they're convinced they know it, which is the real definition of love. Something that's as basic as air. Something that's as basic as food. We should know what love means. Unfortunately, we don't. If we did, divorce would not exist. If we did, there would never be fighting. If we did, disputes would rarely occur. That are I'm not talking about disputes on minimal things or even uh, lachic things. I'm talking about disputes that are break relationships up. So the problem is that most of us define lust as love. We define lust as love. We define a desire as an emotional state of mind. Desire is a something that you have that's temporary until it's satiated. It exists. Once that satiation wears off, it comes back again. That's a desire. As soon as it's satisfied, it's as if it never existed. Once you eat, it's as if you were never hungry. Once you have sex, 
it's as if you were never hot and you never really needed it and there was never like, who are you again? What are you doing in my house? This is, this is desire. This is pure lust. It, when it's fulfilled, it's as if it never existed. And quite frankly, sometimes it actually makes you disgusted of it. Disgusted that you ever had this desire. Love, on the other hand, love is something that does not go away. Love is not something that's temporary. Love is not something that is based on anything. Love simply exists once you know what it is. It simply exists without conditions. Love is much easier for a woman to understand because every normal woman has it for her children. The feelings that a woman has for her children, not always a father, the feelings that a woman has for her children are unexplainable. The fact that she's willing to die for her kid, even though he curses her out, is not a normal thing. If somebody cursed out a guy, the first thing they would get is the, f- is the five fingers that he has in his right hand. Most guys don't want anyone to curse them out or yell at them. And if they had the ability, they'd, they'd react physically. If that person is their son or daughter, they may not get physical, but they'll definitely say something. Not always with a woman. Not always with a woman. Sometimes the nastier the child is, the more she loves him. The more she loves her. The more she feels bad for them. Oh, he's confused. Oh, she's confused. Oh, she doesn't really know what she's saying. No, she knows. She's telling you all those things. She means it. No, no, she doesn't mean it. Why? Why do you say she doesn't mean it? It doesn't make any sense that she, you're saying it as a mean it just because she's your daughter? No, you don't understand. She's not my daughter. She's my body. She's not my daughter. Never, no man is ever going to understand the love of a woman to their ch- children. She's not my daughter. She's not my son. He's my body. He was inside my body. He was an organ. Like my hand, like my head, like the brain, like the heart. You cannot tell me what my brain says. He's in, the brain is inside me. You can't tell me stop loving your brain. It's really mean to you. What do you mean? It's my son. It's, my, it's the same thing. So that's what men generally do not and cannot understand. Because they cannot give birth. Thank God. But, that's also why women have a much easier time understanding what love is, but also an easier time confusing it too. It's easy for them to understand it, because they can understand the rationality of love. That's not based on anything, but it's also very easy for them to become irrational themselves. Men, on the other hand, are more rational beings that Things need to make sense. Things need to make sense in most cases. So when they see a wayward child and the Torah says, yeah, we killed that wayward child. Guys don't have a problem with that. You see, there's a, there's a parasha in the Torah says there's a kid. He's younger than 13 years old. He's 12, 11 years old and he overeats and he drinks alcohol and he's bad to his parents. He doesn't want to listen to anyone. Torah says we kill him. We kill, he's before Bar though. We kill him. It never actually happened in reality. Some say it did. But the point is, we kill him. According to the Torah, if there, such a child existed at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, the time of the Sanhedrin, they would kill him, even though he's only a minor. Why? Because they say, if he's like this now, against his own parents, he goes and curses his own parents, it's only a matter of time before he becomes a sinner against God. So it's better we kill him while he's still innocent against God because that's a crime you can't you can't just fix by saying I'm sorry now you tell this story to men they don't have a problem with it for the most part unless they're feminine unless they're, fe- no, be met, be met. Unless they're feminine and they, they they think no there are some men that are feminine they're mo- more emotional and so on 
And there you will have more of a problem with it. But most men will not have a problem with this story, with the logistics of the story. Yeah, the kid's rotten. Kill him. What's the problem? Kvod Hashem. Like they're like, think it's like the suit. It's good. What, what's the problem? It's a lot of Torah. Just like eating kosher. What's the problem? Anyone to Isha, man, there's no problem with this law. Women, on the other hand, cannot get themselves to think about this. Why? What do you mean? You're to kill a son? You're to kill a child? Because he's a bad kid? Immediately they minimize it. Why? Because to them, the child is his mother's organ. It's a body part. It's not a different. It's not separate. It's not separate. Like it's, it is for the father. So that's why it's something that the women understand the rationality of love while men have to work on it a little more. Yes, question. Ken. But not at that age. Yeah, later on it became obviously. He tried killing his father. So the Midrash here says that a person, Tiferet Yisrael says, a person may love another because of the favors that he receives from him. But his love is for the favors, not for the person. Such a love is self-love, which has no future. Now, there are other examples of such things. For example, loving a woman because she's beautiful. Once the young couple meet each other, they swear that they fell in love right away. They swear to it. I love her. She's the best. She's my soulmate. She's the this. He's my soulmate. He's the this. Oh, ah. And three weeks later, they broke up. What happened? I thought he was your soulmate. Soulmates don't usually go away like headaches. Now nah, he's run and he smells and he's cheap and he's this. Wait a minute, what happened to the soulmate? Yeah, I made a mistake. How many mistakes can you make in a life? Most people make it their whole life. Divorce rates right now in the Western world are north of 90% in some places. 90%. 90%. It's a disaster. 90% meaning you're better off not getting married in, in these places. Why? 90% chance is not going to make it within a couple of years. What's the point? What's the point of being married just to break up? What's the point of investing five, six, seven years into a temporary relationship? Just send each other an email. Yeah, let's just imagine we were together. Let's just imagine it. So when a woman is love because of her beauty, the problem is, is that this beauty is not going to last. It's not going to last. Not that she becomes ugly, but no one stays 20 forever. When a person is loved for their money, The problem is that as soon as that person's money goes away or their generosity goes away, so does the love. And this is actually one of the primary reasons for divorce today is money. Either because somebody lost money and now they cannot handle the fact that there's a major adjustment to the life and the lifestyle they had. They were used to having a vacation house in every state. They were used to having a certain type of car a certain type of food, a certain amount of servants in the house, a certain amount of this, and a certain amount of uh, glamour, and all of a sudden the guy just declared bankruptcy, or the woman declared bankruptcy, and now, what am I, stuck over here going to work? You go to work. I'm going to find a new husband. You go to work. I'm going to go find... So that means that the whole thing was fake. All you liked is the money he or she gave you. Sometimes men marry women for money. Sometimes it's the opposite. Unfortunately, it's the it's most times it's um, women marry men for money, but that's not because women have more uh, attachment to it than the other. It's just because men tend to make more money, at least in recent years, than women do. In the recent past, that, that, a lot of that has changed, but for the most part, 
and he, uh, many, many women fall into a fake relationship thinking that it's going to get better with the, uh, with the diamonds. Just like the diamond quality is going to get better over time as, as the years go on, because she's going to get more and more diamonds and build a collection, she thinks the marriage is going to get better. No, no, I'll, I'll love him over time. Yeah, but he's 25 years older than you. He, he's probably not going to make it a long time. Sad reality that your mindset of what you just said is their mentality also, that they think about that. They already think about him dying before they actually met. There's actually a famous joke when a, uh, a widow, a widow decided, you know what, it's time for me to get married again. So she got married. After she got married to the second husband, she realized she can't stand the guy. She started praying to Hashem, Hashem, I don't want much. I don't want much. All I want you to do, Hashem, it's just bring me back to what I was before. Bring me back to being a widow again. But well, you married the guy. You loved him. Now you wish him to die. You guys are not catching the jokes. I have to actually explain it to you guys. She's wishing for the new husband to die. Okay, I'll give you guys another joke. You guys, my, you guys are slow. Uh, another joke. Another marriage. The marriage jokes are easy. Another joke. One guy looks at a picture on the wall. Wow, what a beautiful picture. $100 million picture. Psh, wow, what a picture. And his wife feels a little bit left out. He's saying, beautiful picture, beautiful picture, beautiful picture. She wants some attention. It's all right. No, he signed a ketubah, no? He says, no, what about me? What about me? He says, when you hang on the wall like that, I'll say you're beautiful also. <laughs> so anyway, Rabotai, the same is true for any attachment which is based on physical and material needs alone. When the motivation is God, the Sefer Musar says, once the motivation is gone, the love ceases to exist. The Chelek Le'olam Abba says that this is including all types of love. This is not, when it says, Kol Avashi Tluya any love that depends on a specific cause, it's referring to every type of relationship. It's not just referring to a husband and wife. It's talking about every single relationship, whether it be brothers, sisters, colleagues, boss and his workers, customer relationship, everything. If it's dependent on something, it will cease to exist. Nothing is better evidence than the actual life. And I remember one of the customers that we had became friendly with us, very friendly with us. She was a neighbor. She lived in the building, and she became friendly. We gave her a lot of advice about her awful, disgusting marriage and her drunk husband that was a disaster and her demented daughter, and we tried befriending her while also helping her financially. And we befriended her, and she would show up to our house unannounced many times. Her husband showed up unannounced. And at some point, we hired them to work for us. And they wrote letters about us of how wonderful we are as human beings. You would think I was the Mashiach before I did Shuba. Her mother wrote letters about me and published it on the internet of how wonderful I am, and my wife, and me, and my wife. And me, and wow, and me, and wow, and hey, all the stuff you would think, wow, Mashiach, 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 Yaron, 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 it was Mashiach, it was Mashiach. You guys didn't know it was Mashiach before I did Shuvah? Missed out. So anyway, this, this woman, she was a friend, a neighbor, became an employee, an investor, everything. Why? Because I made her a bunch of money, everything was going good. Why not? Free psychiatrist, free this, free that. Everything is wonderful, right? Now, that was when everything was going good. The minute we lost money, criminal, thief, thief, yeah, Satan, Malachamavit, Amalek, yeah, oh, sued me. To this day, she's after us. To this day, she's trying to torture us. It's been years. To this day, she's doing everything she possibly can 
to destroy our comfort, destroy our life. We left. We don't have anything. I barely have a couple of months rent in the bank. What do you want for my life? Mach Shema is a Jewish. Abu Dazara all the way. The person is... Ask relevant questions, please. The point is, the point is, Abu Tai, we see here as a perfect example that Hashem Barach give me in my life. He gives you the same examples. You just have to pay attention. What? You have a Mishnah to teach. But how? Love cannot be based on anything. He gives you the experience in your life. He gives you the experience in your life. Why? Here. Yeah. When everything was good, you were Mashiach. As soon as something went off, not that I did something on purpose. I lost more money than everybody. I was my biggest customer. I was my own biggest customer. I lost more than everybody. I lost the firm. I lost the money. I lost everything. But no, it doesn't make a difference. He stole it, and he's hiding it, and he, he's putting it in Panama, and he's putting it in Jehannam. He's, he's hiding it. And he's it. All the accusations, Mamas, like the UFOs are hiding it for him. Every conspiracy you can possibly imagine, she's making up. Till this day, I was in court today for this. This day, I have a million and a half years. The other day I told you guys, I have 150 reasons to cancel the lecture. This was one of them. To this day, she's going, eh, eh, ah, every conspiracy in the world. The SEC investigated us, found nothing. FINRA investigated, found nothing. Why should they found nothing? Because we didn't steal anything. We simply lost money. More for us than anyone else. But no, ah, ah. Why? Well, you worked for him. You knew what was going on. No, I didn't know. What do you mean? You worked there. You used to be a stockbroker. You, used to, you know more than him. Now all of a sudden, everybody's blind, everybody's stupid, everybody didn't know. Why? Because the truth is inconvenient. The truth is inconvenient. So Rabotai, you have to understand, if you have one of those relationships, don't over-invest into it, not into a customer, and not into any other relationship that's going to be based on something. Because the day is going to come, and the something will just disappear. And so with the relationship, why break your heart? Why? Learn from the shiur. Shiur is free. That lesson, very expensive. So now, Rabbi Yonah says that this is referring to those who enter relationships in order to be admired and loved, rather than to love other people. Rabbi Yonah gives a huge chidush. He says that this is not only referring to love not lasting because it's dependent on something, it's also for those people that are entering the relationship for the wrong reason. Not because they want money from the person, they have the money. Not because they want looks, they have the looks themselves. He's talking about the party that's the opposite. He's talking about the woman that's the so-called arm candy. He's talking about the so-called old rich guy. He says they are not going to last. Why? Why they're not going to last? Because they're entering a relationship in order to get something. No, you're not getting the money, but you're getting the admiration and the kavod because you have money. You're getting the admiration and the kavod because you have looks. Remember, as soon as they get used to you, that kavod and admiration will go away. As soon as they see how you look like when you wake up in the morning with cobwebs coming out of your eyes, and what your laundry looks like before it goes into the laundry machine, all of a sudden you're not so pretty. All of a sudden you're not so sexy. All of a sudden you're not so rich. As soon as they see you lose your temper because somebody cuts you off, or somebody took money from you, or whatever, all of a sudden they don't like you so much. All of a sudden, they start mouthing off to you. So you being the old man that thinks, oh no, I got the money. I don't have anything to worry about. She, she's the one that has something to worry about. No, 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 you too. That's the chidush of Rabbi Yuna. He says, you too. Both parties are in dear danger. Dear danger. So, a person needs to understand that their love cannot depend on anything. Simply anything. Now, Yitzchak Avinu didn't just 
lived the Torah himself, he had a life of Torah, a life full of Torah, a wife full of Torah. And if you go to Sefer Bereshit, in chapter 24, verse 67, You see how it reminds us over here that Yitzchak Avinu only fell in love with Rivka after they got married. Now once they become married, they become a single soul. In Shemaim, the Gemara says, a person is going to get a spouse like them. The Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 2, from the beginning of the Gemara person is going to get a spouse based on their actions. If he's tzaddik, he'll get a modest woman. If he's rasha, he'll get an immodest woman. So the Chachamim asks, wait a minute, why isn't a tzaddik going to get a tzaddikah? Righteous get righteous. And wicked get wicked. Why does the righteous get a modest and the wicked gets immodest? What does one thing have to do with the other? So Rashi explains, if he's tzaddik, we'll give him a modest woman. Why? Because if she's modest, she's much more likely to be righteous. If he's wicked, we're going to give him a immodest woman. Why? Because if she's immodest, she's definitely wicked. And we cannot give a tzaddik a wicked woman. Because who's making all of this? Hashem. Hashem is making the matches. So all of those people that are waiting for shiduch, should focus more on doing tshuva. Focus more on doing tshuva. Why? Because it is possible that Hashem has the shiduch in the world for you. It's likely that Hashem has the shiduch for you, but your shiduch is better than you. Your shiduch is better than you. So let's say, for example, you, let's say we'll go from 1 to 10. 1 being the lowest righteous, wicked person, 10 being tzaddik. You're a guy, you want a shiduch, and you now are starting to do tshuva, you're at uh, level uh, 5. Hashem created a person just for you, brought them from Kisei Kavod all the way from Shamaim, brought them to this world, hundreds and hundreds of light years down, brought them to this world f- to be your shiduch. Little tzadika, she's level 7.5. She's level 7.5, you're, number, you're 5 still. You're still in your diapers. She's seven and a half, tzadikah, she's good, she's not ten, she's not tzadikah, seven and a half though, seven and a half is good. Problem is, Hashem cannot make the shiduch. Why? It will be a punishment for her. And if she's tzadikah, she does not deserve a punishment to be with you at level five. So Hashem is going to wait for you to do tshuva. And you get yourself higher to be good for her. Now, if you continue going on your merry way of making sins and staying at level 5 or going lower, especially if you make the sin of wasting seed, you should know that Hashem will take your zivug and give it to somebody else. And you'll have to find another person that's a loser just like you. You want to go down to level 2? Then Hashem has to give you a loser that's just like you, a level 2. You want to be a donkey, I'll give you a donkey. That's what we actually learned from this week's parashat, parashat Balak. Parashat Balak, we find out, we learn about Vayar Balak, Ben Tzipor et Kol, Asher Asai Yisrael Ha'emori. Balak, the son of Tzipor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. He realized that Am Yisrael is coming soon, he wants to destroy them, but he knows he doesn't have the power against them. They have a prophet called Moshe. They have to go against them. How do I do it? They say, listen, you need somebody that's just like Moshe. Oh, who's like Moshe? Only one person in the world. Who? His name is Bil'am. Bil'am is like him. He has actually a power that Moshe doesn't. He says, oh, go, go, go get him. Tell him we'll give him any amount of money. Tell him we'll give him whatever he wants. We'll give him kavod. We'll give him this. We'll give him this. We'll give him this. We'll give him this. And the Torah says, the, the Gemara actually says that Bil'am was actually greater than Moshe Rabbeinu in one aspect. Was greater than Moshe Rabbeinu in one aspect. The Tanah Deve Eliyahu, the book by Eliyahu and Avi, says 
that Bil'am was actually greater than Moshe Rabbeinu in one aspect. He knew, the Gemara says, the moment, the rega, that Hashem is angry. He knew there's a moment in the day that Hashem is angry. So, Eliyahu Navi says that when it says that God says to Moshe, you, however, must remain standing with me. But to Bilam, he says, he sees a vision of Shaddai while fallen and with uncovered eyes. So here he shows that Hashem liked Moshe, obviously, much more than Bilam. The problem is that even though he liked Moshe, he loved Moshe much more, Moshe says to Hashem in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 13, he says, Hashem, allow me to know your ways. Allow me to know your ways. But to Bilam, it's actually written in this week's parasha, Bilam knows the highest will, meaning he already knows Hashem's ways. And also says again, he sees the visions of the Almighty. So there was actually something that Bil'am knew more than Moshe. But we found out from this parasha that after Balak's people convince him to come, Bil'am starts going towards Balak and over there we find out that once his donkey, his Aton, sees the angel, and he doesn't see the angel, the Aton gets scared, the donkey gets scared, and he starts hitting the donkey. He starts hitting the donkey. And the donkey says, Batoma Aton, Hashem actually opens the mouth of the Aton, opens the mouth of a donkey. The donkey starts talking like a person. In chapter 22, verse 30, it says, And the donkey says to Bilam, He says, Am I not your she-donkey? Am I not your donkey? He says to Bilam, Am I not your she-donkey? That you have ridden upon me all your life until this day? Have I been accustomed to do such a thing to you, meaning going against you? Why are you hitting me? These three times you're hitting me. I've been your she-donkey from the... Your whole life. What does it mean? The Chachamim say, when the Aton, the female donkey, is telling to Bilam, Bilam, I've been your donkey your whole life, that you've been writing me your whole life, meaning that she was his wife. The, the Bilam made the donkey his wife. So the Gemara asks the same question you do. And they say, how could such a disgusting, filthy, despicable person have prophecy? How could it be that he has prophecy? It's, he's, he's making one of the greatest sins that there is to make, which is called bestiality. Which, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, bestiality, in, according to the Torah, is the same thing as homosexuality. According to the Torah, bestiality, which means a person with an animal, as disgusting and filthy as it sounds, in the eyes of Hashem, it means the same thing as homosexuality. Same exact thing, nothing different between the two. So the Torah asks, how could it be that such a person get prophecy, and not only get prophecy, get something that Moshe Rabbeinu, the prophet of all prophets, not get? So here we learn the Gemara uses there's two opinions. One opinion is that he was not getting prophecy because of this. He was actually a wizard. That's a minor opinion. The common opinion the Gemara says is that comes from this verse in this parasha, chapter 24, verse 3. It says, It says, The words of Bilam, son of Beor, the words of the man with the open eye. So the Gemara asks, what does it mean, the, the, the words of the man? Meaning the prophecy of the man with the open eye. What does it mean, the guy with the open eye? That Bil'am only had a single eye. He only had one eye. The other was just a hole in his head. So Hashem had one, his whole body was full of sins. His whole body was full of sins. But there was one part of his body that was pure and did not sin. What is it? The eye he didn't have. The hole. So the prophecy would enter 
through the hole that he had in his head. That's where the, the Gemara says the prophecy entered. But here we see Rabotai, the point, the point, the most important point is to see that even someone that knew the truth can still fake themselves out and make excuses for themselves and live a life full of falsehood. Whether it be his wrong definition of love by falling in love with a donkey or wrong definition of how to serve Hashem. So, the Torah here says, what about a love that's not dependent on anything? What about if it's not dependent on anything? Torah says, but if it doesn't depend on a specific cause, it will never cease. A love that does not have anything that is dependent on. It's not dependent on money. It's not dependent on sex. It's not dependent on looks. It's not dependent on uh, a certain admiration, kavod. It's not dependent on anything. This is real love. This is love that will never end. The Rambam and Rav say a relationship that does not depend on material benefits such as wealth or beauty, but instead on an unselfish attachment based on a mutual respect and concern will endure. Now, Sefer Musar continues by saying, the love of a disciple for his master or the love of scholars who assemble to study, meaning people that learn Chavuta together, never vanishes. Since, we're motiva- since they're motivated by their search for the truth and wisdom together, which is a lasting value, their love for each other will also last forever. So what Sefer Musar is trying to explain to us is that the love between a teacher and a real student, not just somebody that knows who he is and watches a few YouTube videos. I'm talking about a teacher and a real student. Someone, Rabbi says something, he does it. No questions asked. He actually fulfills the Gemara, be scared of your Rabbi like you're scared of God. Real student. I'm not talking about like the disciples of Rav Ovadia. The disciples of the Chazonish. The disciples of the, uh, of, of, uh, uh, you know, all of the giants. Real students that the rabbi said something, it didn't make a difference. There's no debate in their head. Is he right? Is he wrong? I'm not so sure. Huh? There's nothing like that. He said it's Kodesh. Whatever came out of his mouth, it's holy. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't make sense to you because you're a fool. It has nothing to do with him. It's your lacking. And that is, they treat the rabbi like a Sefer Torah because he is a Sefer Torah. He's a living Sefer Torah. That type of relationship lasts forever. That's why you see certain people still mourn the death of their rabbi. Even though sometimes people mistake, they mistake this relationship. Like for example, some of the people that worship the dead rabbi that they never even had a real relationship with. Like people that worship the Rebbe, the Bavitcher Rebbe, or Rabbi Nachman bin Breslev. You never knew him. You're 20 years old. He died 24 years ago. You weren't even born yet. Yeah, but I read his books. So what? You read uh, Moshe Rabbeinu's book. How come you're not crying over him? You read Rabbi Akiva's book. You read uh, Rabbi Yudan Asi's book. Gemara. How come you're not crying over them? So there's a lot of people fake themselves out into these false beliefs because they're trying to humanize God and so on. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about people that really have a real relationship with their rabbi. That type of relationship, that love between a student and, a, and, a, and his uh, master is something that could last a lifetime, beyond a lifetime. You see some of the students of Abu Vadya, to this day, they mourn every single year during his yard site. To this day, to this day when they read his book, there's a little tear that comes down. To this day, they get excited when they read his books as if he's telling them everything right now. And the same thing with all the, the other giants before them. Also, the love between a chavuta, two people that study together. People that study together, they develop this special relationship that some say is more intimate 
spiritually, obviously, than even a marriage in some cases. There's a very famous Chavuta in the Gemara, Rabbi Yochanan and Resh Lakish. Now, I had a chidush about the story because the story itself bothered me for years. Bothered me how it ended. And the way it starts, the Gemara says, is that Resh Lakish, Allah Shalom, before he became a walking, living Sefer Torah and one of the most extraordinary Baalet Shuva that ever lived, was head of the mob. Nothing more, nothing less. He was the head of the mob. He was a head criminal. Everyone was scared of him. And he was very strong physically. One day he sees a beautiful woman dr- swimming in the middle of the river that was so beautiful she was shining. And in those days, almost 2,000 years ago, there was a generation of beautiful people of Yerushalayim. A special generation of people from Yerushalayim that had beauty that actually made them spark and shine. Like physically shine, not just, oh yeah, she's good looking. No, no. Like they would actually shine like a diamond. Huh? You watch too many movies, yes. So, anyway, a vampire shine? A vampire shine? I don't know. A vampire shine? I don't know. I don't know vampire shine. I haven't met one. Time to come to you. So, the vampire, the vampire is not in the story. Vampires didn't live in Igmar. But, uh, the word Sadiqim at least. But anyway, the Rabbi Ochanan was one of those people. His family was from Yerushalayim, one of those beautiful people. The Gemara says that Rabbi Yochanan would sit in the front of the mikveh, the women mikveh, and sit there and let the women look at him before they go into the mikveh. So the Talmudim came to him, Kvod Arav, isn't this not modest that uh, these other people's wives are looking at you before they go into the mikveh? What are you doing over here? You're He goes, I don't look at the women, you fool. I'm just sitting there for them to look at me. Because why, Kvod Arav? Why? He says, because we learned from our sages from before me. We learned from our Torah that a woman, she, before she goes into the mikveh, she'll, whatever she looks at will have an impression. An impression on her that after she dips in the mikveh, that she's going to take that home with her. And then if she, after she goes to the mikveh, the most important thing to do after a woman goes to the mikveh is to be with her husband. There's a special ma'ala, there's a special significance to be together with your husband on the night of the mikveh. A lot of people don't know this, myself included, I didn't know this, that there's a special significance to go and be with your wife intimately on the day of the mikveh. You're not allowed to delay it to such an extent that you can cancel out other mitzvot or are actually obligated to cancel out other mitzvot in order to be with your wife during that day. Even to such an extent the Torah, the, the, the book of Deuteronomy says that a person that cancels the Shi'ut Torah, for example, someone that gets in the way of Torah, someone that uh, cancels a Shi'ut Torah, someone that uh, cancels a uh, funding for it, or any gets in the way of Torah, gets the worst curse in the Torah called Aru. Aru. Aru means the worst curse in the Torah. But the Torah tells us, Alacha is, if someone, let's say, for example, gives a Shi'ut Torah to a thousand people, they invited him, Say, you have to go give the shiur to a thousand people. They're either all going to become Christians or they're going to do tshuva. And he finds out, oh, that's the day my wife goes to the mikveh. Allah is not allowed to go give the shiur. Well, what about a thousand people? Somebody else has to do it. It's that important. It's that important. People don't know this. I didn't know this. I got shocked when I heard this. I got shocked. That's how important it is for a husband to be with his wife on the day of the mikveh. To that extent. So now, a person needs to know that Rabban Yochanan was saying that when a woman is with a husband on the day of the mikveh, if she saw something beautiful before, she went into the mikveh instead of looking at a dress or instead of looking at, a, uh, I don't know, at the Steve from the supermarket, she saw something beautiful. She prayed, she has her mind right, she read some Tehilim and so on. That will have an effect on the child. 
that will have an effect on the child if they if they conceive that day. The child will be beautiful. So Rabbi Yochanan actually sat. Rabbi Yochanan actually sat in front of the mikveh for women to look at him because he was one of those beautiful people. Now back to the story. One day, Resh Lakish, his future chavruta, sees one of these beautiful people swimming in the middle of the lake, and he jumps into the lake. He says, "This is the most beautiful woman in the world. It's in the lake. I'm gonna go get her." And he's a criminal at this point. He's not thinking, "Oh, maybe I should take her out on a date." Maybe I should go uh, wine and diner. Maybe I could learn Gemara with take her to Shio with Rabbi Yaron. He's not thinking that, Rabbi. What is he thinking? He's thinking, it's a beautiful woman. I'm here. She's here. Chavuta. <laughs> he goes in there, and as soon as he arrives to the beautiful woman, and he wants to, the beautiful woman turns around, shh, and it's a beautiful man. Beautiful man named Rabbi Yochanan. One of the holiest men that ever lived. Resh Lakish, Baruch Hashem, was normal. He wasn't uh, like this generation of Tel Avivians and New Yorkers. He was normal. He was straight. But he, so he was very, very disappointed. So Rabbi Yochanan knew who he was. He said, listen, you think I'm beautiful? He thought I was a woman, right? He goes, yeah, you too. You're such the biggest disappointment, he says. He says, listen, if you think I'm beautiful, you should see my sister. She's much, much more beautiful. He goes, why are you telling me this? He says, because if you come learn Torah with me every day, you do tshuva, I'll let you marry her. He goes, Be'emet? He goes, Be'emet. On the spot, he agreed. He goes, I'm going to do it. I'll give up everything. If, you, if your sister is as beautiful as you, and you're saying more beautiful, I'll give up everything for it. I'll give up everything for it. They say that he really agreed, and Hashem took away all of his physical strength to the point where he started drowning. So drowning in, 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 in Rabbi Yochanan had to save him, to take him back to, uh, to the shore to save because he, he really agreed. He didn't just like say, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, let me go data for a few months. He agreed. And Hashem took away all his physical power and he started drowning. So now Rabbi Yochanan started learning with him every day. Little by little he became Talmit Chacham. Eventually he got to his level. Amash, they became real Chavuta, not just rabbi and student. Real Chavuta. He married his sister, Everything was fantastic. One day, they have these debates. They have all throughout the Gemara, you'll see that they have several debates between them. What's the name of the other guy? Resh Lakish. Resh Lakish. Resh Lakish. In English, they spelled it R-E-I-S-H. Resh Lakish. L-A-K-I-S-H. Ken, so he was such an extent of holiness that he dis- disconnected from all of the past. He wouldn't even talk to anyone that was dishonest. He wouldn't even talk to them. He wouldn't associate with them. So they knew at that point that anyone that he talks to is a kosher person. So now one day, they have a debate, a lachic debate about stealing wallets and so on whether something is considered stealing not stealing this that all different types of uh, things and uh resh lakish says a point a new point and he's right and rabbi yochanan says ah of course you would be right of course you would be right you used to be a thief so Resh Lakish understood it exactly like all of you just now. You all left, which means it's offensive. It's offensive, right? Yeah. He's reminding him of his past. Resh Lakish took it to heart. He goes, what did I do this whole tshuva for? This whole tshuva I did all these years. I'm learning all day, all night, every day. I became one of the Tanaim, Kodesh Kodashim. Sacrificed my everything. For what? For you to remind me that I'm still a thief? He took a personal, like you guys just understood, like I understood most of my life, and I, how could it be? You're reminding me of this. And Rabbi Yochanan said, what? You're saying, what is it? Well, how is it worth it for you? Saved your life. You're worth nothing before the Torah. Now you have the Torah and you're complaining? And they got into a big dispute, they stopped talking. 
they stopped talking, but their relationship was so close that Res Lakish got sick and died. Their relationship was so close that after they broke up this Chavuta, years and years of studying together, they broke up, Res Lakish got sick and died. Saddest story in ever. Mama, sad story. Even sadder if it's not sad enough. After that, Rabbi Yochanan, they started bringing him different people to study with him. So they're bringing him to study, and he's telling him, okay, what do you, uh, okay, I have this chidush about this. He said, yeah, you're right, Kavod Arav. He looks at them. Oh, okay, I have a chidush about this. Oh, yeah, you're right, Kavod Arav. He looks at them again. Oh, okay, I have a chidush about this. What do you think? Oh, yeah, you're right, Kavod Arav. I don't want you to tell me I'm right. I know I'm right. Res Lakish would give me 25 different reasons of why I'm wrong. That's a chavuta. Not somebody that's giving me a pat on the back. You're right, you're right, you're right. I don't need somebody to tell me I'm right. If I, was, if I didn't think I was right, why I'd say it? He kicked everyone out. One after another, one after another, eventually to the point where he started going crazy. He started going crazy and walking around aimlessly in the middle of the street. Res Lakish, where are you? Where are you? Mama's looking for Res Lakish. He wants you to cry. He wants to cry when you hear this. He's looking for Res Lakish in the middle of the streets. Where are you, Res Lakish? Where are you? Where's my lifelong Chavuta? To the point where all the Chachamim say he lost his mind. They started praying for him to die. And he died. Now, this is a sad, sad story. But I had a question. I had a question. And Baruch Hashem B'Siyat Dishmaya. I had a chidush just the other day. My Rav says it's good. Now, everyone knows that the Rambam posek le'alacha, and the Torah, of course, in the Gemara, it comes from the Gemara, says that it's absolutely forbidden. It's absolutely forbidden to ever remind a Baal Tshuva that he's a Baal Tshuva. Just like it's absolutely forbidden to remind a convert that he's a convert or she's a convert. Like all of these people that say to people, oh wow, you converted? Because they're Asian, or they're black, or they're green, or they're, they come from a different, they don't look like you. They're not a uh, little uh, challah bread, or a uh, matzah bread. They don't look like you. So he's, oh, you converted? Wow, did you used to eat pig? Did you believe in Jesus? Did you go to a church? They ask him all these stupid questions. Like, have, have learn, go learn some Torah. You're not allowed to remind these people they converted. They're considered Am Yisrael 100%. In fact, they're considered more than you as a natural born Jew. You're so obligated to love the convert more than a natural born Jew. More! Not the same, more. And you're reminding them they converted. Not only you're showing lack of love, but you're showing complete disregard to Allah that says you're not allowed to remind them of their past. Why? Because the Rambam specifically says the day they convert is their first day in the world. They're considered a brand new baby. They're no longer considered 37 years old. They're considered zero years old. And a year later, one year old. And two years later, two. What happens after three years? Three years old. What about four? Four years old. And five? Five. At 13, they do bar mitzvah. So, Rabotai, you never ever allow, you're not allowed to, oh, you converted? Wow, what's it going to do for you if I converted? What's it do for you? Same thing with a Baal Tshuva. Unless it's for toilet. Unless it's, there's some useful purpose. There are very few useful purposes to remind somebody of their past. Very, very few. Very, very few. So don't tell me, no, no, I, I just want to check if, uh, what? What do you want to check? I just want to check if he's converted or if he's a Baal Tshuva. I'm not really sure if he's good for Shidduch. That's not a good reason. That's not a, a permissible reason. You're not allowed to ask somebody if they're a Baal Tshuva or if they're a, a convert for, uh, you know, for your own uh, uh, stereotypical mindset. It's not allowed. There are very few reasons where it is allowed. But anyway, Rabotai, I had a serious question about this. It's Allah. It's Gemara. Who wrote it? The Rabbi Yochanan. It's not like it's some, it's some uh, mystical idea that only few people know about. This is Allah. This is what we do after Mount Sinai. You're not allowed to remind the Baal Tshuva that he's a Baal Tshuva. So I didn't understand this story. Why, 
Yeah, Rambam is after. Rambam is after the Gemara. He got it from the Gemara. So I asked myself, how is it that Rabbi Yochanan, Kodesh Kodeshim, this whole debate, this whole argument started how? He told Resh Lakish, yeah, of course you would know. You used to be a thief. So how could he possibly, how could one of the holiest people that ever lived make such a simple but big sin? That's because we all misunderstood it. He didn't make a sin. He did not make a sin. There's no sin here. How could it not be a sin? That's the Chidush. How could it not be a sin? There's no, that's the Chidush. What's the Chidush? Chidush is Rabotai, the Mesilat Yesharim. Mesilat Yesharim, the Ramchal. Rabbi Chaim Moshe Luzato. Mesilat Yesharim, Path of the Just, the book that the Rabbi Chaim Moshe Luzato, the Ramchal, wrote 300 years ago. Mesilat Yesharim says, if you want to do tshuva, go to a Baal tshuva. If you want to learn Torah, go to a Baal tshuva. You want to be something special? You want to do, clean yourself, purify yourself? Go learn from a Baal tshuva. Why Baal tshuva? Why shouldn't I go to the guy that's tzaddik since the day he was born? He says, no. He says, no. Why? Because the Gemara says a Baal Tshuva can get to such a high level that even someone that's righteous from birth cannot get to. What does it mean he cannot get to? Why not? It says because the Baal Tshuva, the Baal Tshuva, he knows what the other side of the street looks like. He knows what the other side of the street looks like, so he has the Yetzirah to go make that sin. He has the Yetzirah to go play poker. He has the Yetzirah to go with women that are not his wife. He has the Yetzirah to go steal, to go do this. He has the Yetzirah to do all these things. The evil inclination, he has it, but he still chose God. He has the Yetzirah to eat pig and milk and meat and shatnez and all that stuff. He has the wickedness in him to go do it. But he says, like Rabban Gamliel says, I know it's tasty to go eat pig and eat uh, milk and meat. I know. But what can I do that my father in heaven said no? Meaning he has the Yetzirah for it, but he still chose God. The righteous from birth doesn't necessarily have that Yetzirah. Why? Because once, if you never tasted it, if you never tasted it, you don't know how good it really is. If you never tasted the sin, you don't know how good the sin really is. You, can't, you don't have the same inclination for pig until you tasted some. You don't have the same inclination for milk and meat until you tasted some. If you never tasted it, more times than not, you're disgusted by it. More times than not, you're disgusted. Milk and meat, it's disgusting. Why would you want to have milk on top of your meat? It's disgusting. Why would you want to have the cockroaches of the sea? They call it lobster. Why would you want to have it? It's a cockroach. Who eats cockroach? What's the matter with you? It's a cockroach with a football uniform. What's the matter with you? Why are you eating it? Why? Because I, ne I never tasted the cockroaches of the sea. So to me, it's disgusting. But someone that ate a lobster, he's like, what? What are you talking about? You know how delicious it is? You know how delicious the great, oh, I have a, 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 what is it, a, a surf and turf or something like that. It's called all these different things. They love this stuff. So the person that did chuba can tell you, listen, I know how good it tastes to sin, but I still don't do it. That's what makes him a tzaddik. Thank you. Excuse me. That's what makes him a tzaddik me, that gets to a level higher than the person that's righteous from birth. So the Mesilat Yesharim, the Baal Mesilat Yesharim, Ramchal says, you want to go do tshuva? Go learn from him. Why? He's going to teach you the full truth. He's the one that's going to know what the sin tastes like. And he's going to help you stay away from it. The other guy, he's going to tell you, why are you going to go with a married woman? Why? It's a sin in the Torah. What's in the Torah? You know how beautiful she is? Why are you going to go gamble? You know, it's sin in the Torah. Why? What gam What's sin in the Torah? You know how fun it is to go play poker with 50000 on the table? Why are you going to go drive on Shabbat? You know, it's holy. What holy? I want to go drive. I want to go to the beach. He doesn't know what sin tastes like. He never did it, poor God. Sadiq, he never did it though. He doesn't know that the rabbi, that's religious from birth, doesn't know what it means to go do all these sins. He doesn't think like that. 
It doesn't look good to him. And even if it's good, it's not that good to go against Hashem. It's not to that such an extent. I'm going to go against it. It's not worth it going against Hashem for it. So the Ramachal says, go learn from the Baal Tshuva, because he's going to tell you, and he says from experience, I know how good it tastes, and it's still not worth it. I know how money, how great things you could do with money, it's still not worth it to chase money. It's still a complete waste of time. Somebody that told you money is the root of all evil and it's terrible, he never had a dollar to his name, ah, eh, you're full of it. Let me see what you see, what you do once you have 10 million in the bank. But somebody that had 20 million, 30 more, 50 million in the bank tells you, listen, all things are a waste of time. What? But, but you have it. Yeah, it's a waste of time. That's a valuable opinion. So the Ramchal says, go listen to him. So now back to our original Chidush. Why did Rabbi Yochanan say to Resh Lakish, we'll let the train stop so you understand the whole Chidush. No. So Rabbi Yochanan says the following. Of course you knew because you used to be a thief. Of course, Resh Lakish, you knew. You have the right answer because you used to be a thief. He wasn't reminding Resh Lakish that he's a Baal Tshuva like Resh Lakish and all of us understood. He wasn't doing such a sin. Chaz Shalom. That was Resh Lakish's mistake for understanding that. That was our mistake for understanding it. What Rabbi Yochanan was teaching us was something extraordinary. He was telling us, not only if you want to go learn Torah, go find a Baal Tshuva that's going to teach you. But if you want to find the truth of Allah, you have to go ask the Baal Tshuva. Why? Because the Baal Tshuva thinks in a way that the righteous from birth does not think. He doesn't think like that. So for example, for example, when the Chachamim wrote certain things about wigs or any of the halachot, they weren't assuming the generation of today was going to even exist, let alone prosper. So when some of them wrote that wigs are permissible, never in their wildest dreams did they think it would become the standard, let alone a multi-billion dollar business that makes the fake hair of the woman, the wig, look drastically better than her real hair to the point where it's actually making every young or old woman look exactly the same. Directly going against what the Gemara said that you're supposed to do as a woman. Directly going against all modest, modesty laws. If you look at the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, it specifically says that chas v'shalom would an old woman wear the hair of a young woman and look young. Meaning, it's a, that's the sin itself. You're not supposed to do that. Creating, it's not about creating more attention. It's not just about creating more attention. It's creating more attraction, negative attention. You're not supposed to create that negative attention, the attention you're not supposed to get. So when they wrote that wigs are allowed, these tzaddikim, these kedoshim, never thought that a secular generation of today would exist and take what they said and completely manipulate it to such an extent where people say, no, it's even better to wear the long six-foot wig then wearing a mitpachat or a, a, a scarf or a hat on your head, it's better. Never in their wildest dreams did any of these tzaddikim ever think that somebody would manipulate their words to such an extent. The same thing goes with all of the other things in the Torah. There are certain things that tzaddikim say that have been manipulated in such a way that literally people have just destroyed it. So for example, one of the things that the Chachamim say, is that you have to be modest as a woman. You have to wear a skirt, a long skirt that covers two th- uh, the, uh, two-thirds of your leg and, and so on. So they, they never thought that people would manipulate it to such a way 
that if you wear any skirt, it's okay, including the pencil skirts. Like, it's okay to wear a pencil skirt because it's a skirt, so it's better than pants. Never in their wildest dreams did these holy people ever think that somebody would manipulate their words to make people think that wearing a pencil skirt or any tight skirt is okay or even permissible. Because the whole point of the skirt is to make you more modest. The pencil skirt, the tight skirt, is more immodest than pants. So they didn't think that you're going to manipulate the words and say, oh, yeah, yeah, any skirt is good, even the short skirt. That, and instead of saying, listen, cover two-thirds of the leg, it has to be four to six inches beyond, pa- past the bottom of the knee, that's the minimum. They never thought that people would turn that into the standard. Like this is the minimum you have to cover is that it has to cover at least the bottom of your knee by four to six inches. That's the minimum. The minimum. Not ideal. Not this is what it's supposed to be. This is the minimum. That if it happens that there's only one skirt that you have and you grew up or something happens, but it still covers the bottom of your knee by four to six inches after you sit down, it's still okay. Never in their wildest dreams that they think that see, people will manipulate their words to say, oh, if it covers four inches, it's fine. If it doesn't, it's also fine. There is another opinion somewhere in the Harry Potter books. So, the Rabbi Yochanan, the chidush that he's giving, is dafka for this generation. He's telling Resh Lakish, of course you knew the truth because you used to be a thief. Meaning, you... Even though you did tshuva and you're holy of holies and you're in the same level as me and you're the best, even though you are, you still remember the days of when you were a sinner. You can think in ways that I cannot think of. Why? I've never had that yet, of, 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 of being a thief. So to arrive in the tr- at the truth, I need you. I need you, I need the Baal Tshuva to arrive at the truth. Why? Because he thinks in the way of the secular person too. So he's going to think of things that I can't think of. Why? I don't have the Yitzhak. And that's what Rabbi Yochanan did. And that's what Resh Lakish misunderstood. That's what the Rambam says that it's the highest level the Baal Tshuva can get to. It's higher than a natural born uh, uh, Jew that's a, uh, that's a tzaddik from birth. That's the highest level. Why? Because he can not only become righteous, but he can think in ways that the righteous person from birth cannot think of. Because he does, he has overcome a yetzerah the tzaddik has never had. And that's also what the Ramchal also says. You want to go do tshuva? Go to the Baal tshuva. Why? Because he's going to tell you about the yetzerah you know from experience. And that's how everything comes together, Abu Tai. That's how it all comes together. It never made sense that such a holy person will make such a small sin, such a big sin, such a simple thing that the average person knows is not allowed. And that's why we, it's a mistake is on us. Again, the Torah teaches us the mistake, the shortage is on us. It's we don't know. Not that they made a mistake. So I think with that, with that, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, 100% Hashem, it's extraordinary how endless the Torah is, but I think we'll finish this section of the the, uh, Shior here. I'll give you guys some uh, questions if you want. We'll continue the rest of the Shior, Bezal Hashem, tomorrow, uh, the second part of the Mishnah. Talking about tomorrow, Bezal Hashem, we'll talk about what are the signs of real love, what are the signs of fake love, what does all of this have to do with Hashem? And also, if we have time, Bezal Hashem, even the laws of intimacy. It's very important for us to know these specific laws of what's allowed and what's not allowed. A lot of people think that they can just do anything they want and because they're already married. Or they can act however they want because they're already married. It's not 100% true. There are certain things that you are obligated to do that you're not obligated to do when you're single, as a matter of fact. So maybe we'll talk about that as well. Because that has a lot to do with not only love, but also with our definition of love, which is mostly mistaken. So we'll take out the good part, the truthful part from the wrong part. And the Hashem, complete it tomorrow.